Hey, good afternoon. Scott Luton, Greg White with you here on Supply Chain Now. Welcome to today's live stream. Greg, how you doing? I am so incredibly stoked for this. So. <laughs> Well, you know, I am too. We had Laura on with Corinne Bursa, uh, I don't know, a month or so, a month and a half or so ago. Yeah. Huge response. Of course, Laura's used to that. But it was the first time she was with us here on Supply Chain Now and our community really got a lot, ton of feedback around that. And we're yeah. talking supply chain talent today with Laura, which is, is, is a topic that we can't talk about enough. So much room for improvement there, right? Yeah, no doubt. We talk about it all the time. We, it was one of our top topics before COVID happened. Right. So, um, you know, and it, it remains a, a top topic for different reasons, but still um, very, very important. And the twist that I like that, that we're going to talk today with Laura, Laura Ciceri, uh, founder of Supply Chain Insights, is job satisfaction. Right. Job satisfaction. Talk about things that aren't aren't talked about enough. So looking forward to her research and, and, and data-driven insights uh, there here, about 1220, 1225. So stay tuned for that. But other than that, it's all about supply chain buzz today. We're Greg and I at every Monday at 12 noon, we tackle some of the leading, most important developments across global in the end supply chain. So stay tuned as we dive into some of that news with our community. Greg, it always brings their A game, right? Yeah, no doubt. I can't wait to hear how, what some of these folks uh, have to say about that. Agreed. Hey, one programming note before we get started here, we're going to say hello to yes. folks that are tuned in. If you enjoy today's live stream episodes, be sure to check out Supply Chain Now wherever you get your podcast from. Subscribe for free so you don't miss conversations just like this one here today. Today, we publish a great episode with Brian York, one of the leading tech entrepreneurs in South America, as he sat down with Enrique Alvarez. So uh, check that out again, wherever you get your podcast from. All right, Greg, we have got a lively Wow, live, lively crew already. Wow. Say hello to a few folks. Uh, Olander. Great weekend, yeah. Agreed. Olander is tuned in via LinkedIn. Good morning. Peter is also via LinkedIn. Great to have you here, Peter. Daria is back. Hello, Daria, via LinkedIn. Pratik, you bet, Pratik. Look forward to having you on a future show. Got to get some of that um, those great insights out uh, live. So I hope this finds you yeah. well. Uh, let's see, Valentine. Good evening. Tell us where you're you're tuned in via LinkedIn from, Valentine. AA, air capital uh, of the country, of the world, air capital of the world in Wichita, Kansas. How how can I get that wrong, Greg? Shocks win. Shocks <laughs> win. Right. I didn't That's get right. to watch it like I, but but uh, my mother was keeping me posted on via text message. Love it. Peter, good morning. Great to see you again. Bradley, exciting topic. Completely agree. Great to have you yeah. with us here, Bradley. Yeah. Grace, Jeff, all oh, good morning. Gary Smith is back with us. Uh, so hello, everybody. All right. So, Greg, are you ready to dive into a few headlines before we bring Lars to series? Yeah, let's three? do that. Yes, please. All right. So story number one, you know, so last week we talked a good bit about the automotive industry, right? Especially as it related to the Japanese market, the Japanese administration's really changing the game over the next, uh, call it uh, four or five, uh, nine years. Um, let's talk about automotive industry uh, as it relates to semiconductors. So this article from Mike Whalen at CNBC points out several automatic automakers are cutting back production due to a shortage in semiconductors. Yeah. Ford and Nissan announced cuts to vehicle production last week. Greg, that comes on the heels of Volkswagen, which announced cuts in December. Uh, demand for vehicles has really been trending up, especially since that two month shutdown that took place early 2020. Um, and for new vehicles, semiconductors are vital. They're using vehicles for things like Bluetooth connectivity, navigation, hybrid electric systems, power steering, that infotainment decks everybody likes in their vehicles these days. Yeah. And who do you think they're competing with? I can't imagine who it could be. <laughs> well, consumer electronics, of course. But if you if you remember when the remote learning uh, became such a requirement, uh, really across glo globally, but certainly here in the States, you know, there were school systems that couldn't find enough laptops. Right. So th there's a lot of different forces battling for that demand. Um, let's see, according to research firm Mortar Intelligence, the global semiconductor market is projected to be worth 
$129 billion by 2025. That will be a tripling of its size just since 2019, Greg. So any additional thoughts when it comes to chips, computer chips? You know, um, you know, I have occasion to talk to companies offline, right? And I have had a lot of companies wondering if I invest in or, or advise semiconductor companies. I'd like to say unequivocally no, <laughs> because I know nothing about semiconductors except that they make all the things that we, we all want go laptops, even uh, audio technology, as you said, all of those things in a vehicle. Um, they're absolute cell phones, right? They're absolutely critical to so many of the devices that we use today, and we use so many devices today. So it's a significant issue, and there's a significant uh, production issue there. So we'll see how that evolves, but there's way too much money in this industry now for it to continue to be a supply for there there to continue to be a supply issue. Great point. Agreed. Um, all right. So let's stick with the manufacturing industry for our second story here. So this Wall Street Journal story from Justin Lahart, uh, we look at how the current recession is impacting the manufacturing industry. So Greg, you want some good news? Uh, always. 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 The Institute for Supply Management, ISM, last week reported that its index of manufacturing activity increased over three points from November to December. And this is the PMI that they release each month. So why is that important? What's, what's three points mean? Let's give it some context. ISM says that the, the index score of 60.7 for December 2020 reflects its highest level in over two years. And, and note for the PMI uh, index, anything over 50 uh, represents growth. So this is 10, 10, more than 10 points over that. Right. Um, as the article points out, this recession, though, has been a really unique one, right? Typically, manufacturing can bear the brunt of any recession, but demand has been up for all sorts of manufactured goods. On the flip side, as we all know, lots of folks are hurt, hurting in the services industries, which are typically, a lot of the services industries can be recession proof. Uh, the continued recovery for the manufacturing industry, which some say has already surpassed pre-COVID levels, well, the months ahead look pretty rosy too. That's great news, Greg, isn't it? I think it is. Uh, you know, I think a lot of this hinges, I, I think many of us know if, I mean, if, if, if you think about it, a lot of this hinges on the continued support of the government uh, via stimulus programs, because there are, as you said in the previous article, significant demand issues or significant supply issues and significant demand shifts mm. as people and companies change their priority or position in the marketplace. So uh, it's going to be, it's going to be tough to chase and it's going to be tough to predict for some years yet, but it is, um, you know, it's good to see that, that it, at least for the time being, we're going to be good. We'll have to see what the impact of, of, inflation is because the dollar is projected to drop about 21% in value mm -hmm. this year. So, um, you know, we'll have to see what kind of impact that has, but at least for now, things are looking up. Yep. Agreed. Love the manufacturing industry. I love my time in that special metal stamping where I lost a couple of my nine lives, I believe. Um, well, say I'd, I'd love to know more about that industry. Not this, <laughs> not this, I know, not this episode, of course, but <laughs> Uh, really enjoyed it. Uh, let's see, Larry Klein is here with us from Albany, Georgia. Great to have you, Larry. Uh, hey, Scott, just one bit of input. I got some direct input on that um, from my friend Cliff Williams, who is now retired from a banking accounting career. And he said definitively, it is Albany. <laughs> so I think, I think it was Gary Smith who said, who, who came closest yes, or last week. So right. if, if you're wondering, that's, that's the way the locals say it, <laughs> but you know, there's an Albany in like 26 States or something that's like right. that. So, so, you know, I think it depends on where you are, Agreed. but funny that I've always been fascinated by that. <laughs> uh, David is with us as well. Hello, David, Tom Raftery, uh, coming late to the party as always. Hey, Tom, you're here though. That's all, all yeah. that matters. Yeah, fashionably late. That's right. Uh, Dr. Vias is here from uh, Bangalore, India. So great to have you here. Happy New Year to both of you. Uh, let's see here. Uh, so any comments um, 
you know, speaking of the manufacturing industry, if, if uh, you're working in the industry, what are you seeing, right? What are you hearing about in your local market? You know, tell us, yeah. love to get your insights there on, on um, manufacturing. All right. So in our final story, before we bring in our featured guests here today, it is the season, Greg, for returns, 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 yeah. returns. So let's talk about record breaking numbers for retail returns. But before we do, this is a great article from Supply Chain Dive, of course, via, via the one and only Emma Cosgrove over there. Right. But, you know, Greg, uh, it wasn't too long ago that we were exchanging pictures of our household return situation. Tell me more about the, the Greg White household. Yeah, well, um, you know, we have three daughters and three significant others uh, for those daughters as well. So um, it was a pretty big year for us here in the household. So, you know, I, I the thing that stands out to me is after Christmas was going out to the garage where we um, stored delivery boxes until, right. you know, until the, the re recycling truck came afterward and just the pile. I wish I, I wish I had shot you, uh, that picture so you could share it, but that experience, um, was eye opening because it was taller. We have a, a wave runner in the, in the, on a trailer in the garage and it was taller than that and almost as long. So <laughs> it was, uh, I mean, it was eye opening. And, and then um, I went for the first time on the annual returns spree. Right. Uh, because we went on my anniversary this year because we, you know, we didn't have enough going on in the Christmas holidays. So we got married between Christmas and New Year's. Uh, and so we went on our anniversary and that's part of what we did in addition to dinner. Uh, but that was also an experience in both. Um, frankly, the futility of returning things and the lack of thoughtful customer experience in it. Right. Um, and then, and then of course we've, we've heard all about the waste. And in the last week I've talked to two companies in Europe who are focused on circular economy, reverse logistics returns and that sort of thing. And the numbers of products that just go completely to waste is stunning. I didn't, I honestly didn't believe it first. I think here on a show, I may have questioned the statistics and I was wrong. I'm just going to confess right here. I was wrong. I saw pictures of piles of things and it, it has a lot to do with, unfortunately, the premium brands and large physical products. People are actually throwing away couches mm. that they don't want, not the couch they replaced the couch they ordered that the company does not want returned to them. So clearly there is a lot to do there. And, you know, both you and I posted about this article and I think both of us got thousands and thousands of people viewing and talking about this particular thing. Clearly this is coming to the forefront. I'm thankful for that because this is a huge contributor, huge contributor. This should make, all this should make Tom Raftery happy. But it's a huge contributor to waste in the supply chain. And as, as I will continue to do, I challenge consumers to figure out a way to shop the most thoughtful retailers or figure out a way to, um, to help solve this problem themselves. In fact, Corinne Bursa posted something either last night or this morning and was talking about how many retailers are trying to solve this returns problem by enabling or encourage you to keep the product, even if you get your money back or donate it. Mm. So I, I think there, there are some great opportunities to do that. Agreed. Agreed. I was dropping some of the comments there. T squared who, who holds down the fort for us on YouTube says he's seen a case for reverse logistics here, but some companies are giving refunds yet telling customers to keep yeah. the product. We're going to yeah. touch on some of that here momentarily. And they're just not going to do that, by the way. Right. I mean, especially if it's a couch. Yep. So <laughs> we have to enable another way to disposition that product. Agreed. All right. So in this article from Emma Cosgrove over at Supply Chain Dive, UPS is reporting record-breaking returns business. The company expected almost uh, 8.75 million returns last week. That is some 23% higher over the highest weeks 
from last year's holiday season. So we talk mm-hmm. about bracketing a lot. Bracketing was mentioned in the article. It's one of the various drivers. Of course, e-commerce volume, naturally. Changing consumer purchasing preferences, all of those are factors. FedEx is also reporting returns volume beyond historic levels over the last six months of 2020. In other returns news, Amazon announced last month a no-box, no-label policy. Very interesting. Walmart is working with FedEx to pick up returns from consumers' homes, which is not new for retail. Uh, Perhaps one of my first major returns experiences is it, it was when HP came and made made me returning a printer so easy a few years back when we were printing off a ton of courseware. Had a great experience there. Um, a key question, though, as Emma points out, this is from the article, quote, the question is, do retailers have the internal capacity to physically or virtually reshelve the merchandise that does make it back into their hands, end quote? I would add, do they have the will to do so? Yeah. Right? Um, I can tell you that the answer to all three of those is no. <laughs> so um, the good news here, the great news is our reverse, our newly reinvigorated reverse logistics series with the great folks over at the Reverse Logistics Association. They are really uh, proliferating and, and disseminating leading uh, thought leadership and best practices around the returns and, and for that matter, sustainability and, and reverse logistics, all that whole world. As Tony Sheroda, who heads up the RLA, calls it the dark side of supply supply chain. Uh, Darth Sheroda, maybe. We'll see. But he's back with us. We know we can't call him the Godfather. So (laughs) he is back with us January 29th at 12 noon Eastern time as we kick off this monthly series that's going to take a deeper dive into this fascinating world of returns and reverse logistics. So, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's fantastic. And I think another thing that is highly encouraging is the why. For some of these technology and logistics companies who are are participating in this, right? Their first cause is to save, you know, is to save waste, is to eliminate waste, right? So, I think that's an important uh, that's an important why. And if you work back from that, you can have the most impact on the supply chain. So. Agreed, agreed. Hey, I'm gonna share a couple of comments going back to our manufacturing discussion in articles one and two. So David says uh, he's seen a shortage on fuses and electrical uh, components in Mm. his neck of the woods. Uh, Let's see here. AA, of course, they're celebrating a little bit in Wichita. Spirit Aerosystems happy as FAA ban on 737 MAX is lifted. They're projecting more rapid production of the 737 fuselage in Wichita. That was an interesting uh, settlement. I'm not sure it's finalized yet, but what what Boeing, the concessions Boeing is making. Let's see here. Peter. Yeah. All non-essential retailers are closed in Quebec, so no returns for at least another month when the shutdown is expected to be lifted on February 8th. Hmm. Wow. Peter also says the 737 grounding had massive financial impact on airlines as we had to keep the engines turning for months with no revenue. Great point there. And and, and Peter, as we pointed out, spent years at years uh, Air, Air Canada. Canada. Air Canada. Yeah. As Aaliyah, hello, good morning. Great to have you here via LinkedIn. Uh, hey, quick, before we bring on our, our special guest here today, Olander is looking to build his network so he can find better opportunities and, and knowledge across supply chain. So y'all make sure you connect with Olander. Great to have you here on the supply chain buzz. All right. So with no great guests here today, really excited about um, what we're going to talk about and who we have. Greg, are you ready to do it? Let's do it. All right. So let's welcome in our featured guest, Laura Ciceri founder of Supply Chain Insights and author of the highly popular blog, Supply Chain Shaman. Hey, hey, Laura, good afternoon. Hey, what a build up. Hey, guys, how are you? <laughs> well, hey, great to great. have you. Thanks. That's absolutely. And it's very genuine. Uh, we got a ton of feedback. And I, I know you do this stuff in your sleep and uh, right. call channels uh, around the globe, but we got a ton of feedback on your first appearance with us here a month or month and a half or, or so ago, as you and, and me and Corinne chatted a wide variety of things, including I enjoyed your commentary on lean and, and how lean's getting beat up a bit. Uh, but today we're talking talent and we're talking job satisfaction. Your Some of your latest research is entitled Managing Supply Chain Talent During the Pandemic, chock full of, of great data points and 
you, 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 it's open for, for folks to get in and learn and, and kind of wrap their head around what we're, we're seeing. That's a, a, a very much uh, appreciated move, Laura. Oh, the open content. Well, I just believe that research shouldn't be behind the paywall. Um, you know, I used to work for analyst firms that made money by having research behind the paywall and my model's different. I followed by about 320,000 people on LinkedIn and they give to me, I give to them and hopefully I help the industry along the way. Undoubtedly. And we yeah. appreciate your time here today. So uh, before Greg asks you a few things about that research, I would love for you to share with us, Laura, out of all the, uh, there's no shortage of developments when you, when you uh, survey global end-to-end -end supply chain and, and, the, and a greater global business community, but what's one, one development in the last week or so you've been tracking? Well, my current Forbes article is on vaccine to vaccinations. I think that the whole industry is learning a lot about the difference between logistics and supply chain through COVID-19. If you think back to the lack of the design of the testing supply chain and the fact that no one really specified common platforms, we ended up with 47 different reagents and a lack of PPE and labor and lack of redesign of the last mile and poor coordination between federal governments and state governments. We've got this going again. And I've been writing a lot about, you know, this is too serious for us not to get serious about. And it's really fascinating to me because, you know, I cover lots of supply chain planning, execution, technology companies. And I've probably had 20 companies call me and say, Laura, I want to help. I want to give my software. I want to give my expertise. But no one is really, you know, answering my phone call, answering my emails. And what's happening is we've got a lot of large consulting companies that I'm sorry, I don't think they know a lot about supply chain. They don't know a lot about planning. They're not really looking at that second dose. And I'm hoping that we can learn that this is not a logistics only. This is a need to really manage source, make and deliver together and manage policy and have better governance between government and state. Because if not, we're in real trouble. I mean, I, it just breaks my heart. We're throwing that Pfizer vaccine into the trash. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think one, one gap, Laura, that I did not even think about is the, the coordination between the state and, and the issuing or, you know, issuing entities, right? I mean, um, you know, we've seen scenarios where the states don't even know how they, they, they specify how a hospital or, or a healthcare provider is to I issue the vaccine, but they can't verify it. Mm. And, you know, we've seen refrigeration breakdown. So they just have a all call uh, and just give it to whoever's handy before it goes bad, which I'm, you know, on the, on the one hand, I feel like is a good thing. On the other hand, I feel like maybe if we had planned a little bit better, we might have had a plan B regards the cold chain, mm. uh, you know, in these things. And I think to some extent, that's exactly what you're talking to is that that coordination helps to facilitate a lot more efficiency and effectiveness as we not only move this product, but but as we also issue it to the to patients, right? I think the cold chain's working pretty well. We should, you know, celebrate that Pfizer and Moderna are doing a good job with UPS and FedEx on the cold chain. Logistics is not our issue. Our issue is policy and our issue mm -hmm. is coordination and really planning for that second dosage. And because of the legal issues around MMR vaccine and the lack of definition of legalities around this vaccine and not really accounting for labor and PPE, I mean, these states are against the wall for nurses and mm -hmm. we're not, you know, this is not only about the last mile, this is about the last inch. And we're not doing a very good job there around the design of the supply chain. So I think our takeaway here is supply chains more than just logistics. Operations warp speed, got us the vaccine, yay. But when I talk to all the really great scientists, they assume this is going to be just like the distribution of the flu vaccine, and it is not. Mm -hmm. And I think there is an awful lot for us to do around policy and building, you know, the global population's belief in this vaccine so that we can get to herd immunity because that's so important. You were talking about semiconductor industry earlier. 
The semiconductor industry is very capacity constrained, dealing with a lot of supply issues because of COVID-19. Almost all of that sourcing is coming out of Asia. And right. we've got to really get our handle on this or we're not going to have some of the component parts, whether it's semiconductor industry or chemical industry, these very labor intensive industries. Well said. All right. Yeah. Um, there's so much more. I'd love to dive in with you, but we're, we we got a, a big bogey. We're going to be talking about talent and, and you've got this excellent uh, data driven research that's been published. Uh, Amanda and Clay, if we could drop that link to Laura's report in the in the comments there. We had a little glitch with LinkedIn earlier today, Laura. So typically our show notes go there. We're gonna make it easy for our, our, our uh, community to access that report. Good. Managing supply chain talent during the pandemic. So really quick, before I turn over to Greg here, you were talking pre-show and you were asking me some, a couple of my key takeaways. And it, it was really tough to narrow it down to a couple. Um, I know we're gonna talk about job satisfaction in particular here in a moment, but two things, it, on page nine of this research report that I find fascinating. First one, companies feel that only 13% of employees are well prepared entering the workforce from college. Holy cow, we've got to we've got to move the needle there. And then secondly, of course, and this is something that, that is not new, the skills gap, talent gap, 63% of respondents cannot find the talent that they need. Mm -hmm. So kind of with a starting point there, let me and, and Greg, before I turn over Let's say hello to a couple of quick folks that entered a little bit late. Kyle, great to have you here up on the West Coast of the States. Great to have you. Scott Ruddick, welcome to today's live stream. Kavan and Sophia is with us here. Sophia is back with us here today. So great to have each of y'all on the buzz here today as we talk talent with the one and only Laura Ciceri. All right. So, Greg, where do we go from here? Uh, well, of course, I want Laura, I'd love to get your your top three takeaways from that. But before we do that, can we address this 13% in terms of preparation? Is that up? Is it down? Is it, I mean, it, is it that much worse or that much better or kind of stable in the industry? I'm, I'm not sure the relative um, numbers historically, right? Yeah, you don't know what to do with it. So let me give a little background. We started this uh, report series five years ago when I started Supply Chain Insights. And we've sort of been tracking uh, how people feel with common questions. And we're getting worse, not better, on uh, the industry's ability to really accept students and really get them to work. And the issue is really math, pattern recognition, data analytics skills. One of the issues is that we sort of slap supply chain talent development into the marketing department of business schools. And mm. marketing, I'm not sure, really understands supply chain. And we're lacking a lot of the data analytics, big data, uh, math skills, and the ability to take those math skills and drive influence management in a uh, profession. Now, we're doing pretty well on execution skills. Our skill issues around logistics, warehouse management are far less than the issues around planning and data and uh, really driving decision support. You know, that that's a, a really good point of it being a, um, a business school kind of thing, sort of traditionally, because, you know, I, I have done some work, A.A. Uh, a. Mohib, who's a studying professor at, at Wichita State, not, not a, you know, not the top school, but I think at least their approach to supply chain is really, really smart. It, it has an engineering component to it and a business school component to it. And, and they do provide a lot of the STEM necessities uh, in regards to supply chain and a lot of the business awareness in regards to supply chain. And that seems like a really logical uh, methodology to me. It's also not strictly, and you know, th this is my observation, it's, it's also not strictly an ORMS, right? Operational yeah. Research Management Science that's right. uh, initiative anymore. That's highly technical, more operations related. And there's so much, um, there's so much added to, or we're aware of so much more of the supply chain complexities than we were in the past that uh, this is a struggle that I've heard academics enunciate frequently is that they are, they believe between 10 and 20 years behind where supply chain is just because the nature of academia is that 
they have to build on these foundations. They write these books, they do their studies, and then they teach it for a number of years. And I think, I mean, this is just, uh, this seems logical to me, considering what you're saying, that we're getting worse, not better. And yet, supply chain education is more plentiful than it's ever been in the past. It seems like supply chain and our recognition there around mathematics and around data, as you spoke to, is outstripping the capacity of academia to keep up. Would you say that's a fair assessment? It is, um, but what is supply chain, right? Now, you know, I think supply chain is source, make, and deliver as it starts from the customer's customer, the supplier's supplier. Mm -hmm. Many times supply chain is being taught as a much more limited topic of yeah. logistics or manufacturing. And there's an awful lot around policy and strategy that is missing in supply chain. And that's one of the reasons why I'm very focused in writing case studies uh, for my next book around how do we cross over selling? How do we cross over to the customer? How do we drive customer policy? Because what's happened in the last decade as we got really infatuated with ERP expansion is we have lost a lot of the basic tenets of source, make, and deliver, being able to come together and drive value because unfortunately supply chain became another function in a functional organization. So right. there's an awful lot to learn here. And as we went from regional to multinational to global supply chains, the supply chain became a more complex nonlinear system, really requiring more advanced math. And it's hard for the schools to keep up. Mm. Yeah. If I can add really quick before we, we kind of, uh, um, I hate using the word pivot these days, but we're kind of, as we move into the job, more of the report. As we get to the actual question. Here we go. <laughs> but Laura, <laughs> we have a, we have a bunch of folks in these live streams, typically they're, that are looking for the next opportunity or looking to break into industry, whatnot. And I would just, uh, a quick point that, that comes out of research you did three or four years ago, I believe, where one of the factoids that came out of that was that supply chain leaders really appreciate your team members that that really understand the enterprise, right? And, and I can't remember the it was it was strong. It may not have been a majority, but it was it was close to it. You know, folks that could see the bigger picture, and and those were the kind of folks amongst other skill sets. But those are the kind of folks that they really like to bring on the team because, as we all know, in in supply chain, you know, one decision here, of course, the ripple effect. You you never know where it'll stop. So love the, I love the data. I love how open you put it out there for folks to consume and make better decisions and, and, and strengthen their organizations and uh, admire that and looking forward to kind of dissecting over the next 10 or 15 minutes, this latest report. So Great. Greg, we are, we want to target three key takeaways and it's tough to bullet down to three in it. Yeah. So let's do that. <laughs> so, Laura, Laura, what would you say are you, are the three most salient points, if you can, if you can boil it down to that, in uh, in your research piece? Well, <clears throat> my top three is that number one, we're struggling with diversity. Thirty five percent of the respondents were women. Fifteen percent were people of color. No offense, guys, but. You know, I've written a lot of articles about supply chain should not be about stale white bread, right? Baby boomers, white men have sort of own the supply chain. Yeah. And, you know, they believe that we have best practices and they perpetuate the best practices on the golf course and in the executive room. And they're not being as open for diversity, whether it's age or different geographies or, you know, women or people of color. And right. I'm not, I'm not all about women for women or, you know, diversity without diverse thought. Uh, so I really appeal to a lot of the older Caucasian men to be more engaging and to accept more diversity and to step back and say, we don't have best practices. 96% of companies are stuck at the intersection of operating margin and inventory turns. We're carrying 20 more days of inventory now than we did a decade ago. Mm -hmm. And we've got to be able to really address supply chain in a new way. The second thing that was really telling to me is, you know, a lot of people will hang 
digital or industry 4.0 or artificial intelligence on all the strategy decks. And when I asked them, what do those words mean? Boy, they really struggle. Like, you know, aren't you the dumbest analyst in the world, Laura, that you don't know what digital means or you don't know what industry 4.0 means? But in this research, there is tension and struggle with the millennials and the Gen X really wanting to push forward next generation practices, right? Yep. They know more about the pizza that's gonna be delivered to their home at 12 o'clock than they do the inbound shipment. And we do not have a good way to connect Internet of Things signals. Our signals are inside out, they're not outside in. And our architectures are primarily legacy. So let's embrace and really define next generation supply chain processes. Because in the report, the Gen X and millennials are saying, guys, let's be more open-minded. These screens don't work for me. I'm used to being a mobile employee. I'm spending all my times in meetings having the wrong discussions. You aren't taking my plans seriously. And so let's address what our next generation process is. How do we get the unleashing of talent that's so critical. And the last, and I think probably the most important finding of the report is only one in two supply chain leaders are satisfied with their jobs. What a travesty, right? Yeah. You know, unused potential, greatest risk in supply chain, I think is talent. And, you know, how do we really pull up a seat at the table to design an organization so that people are satisfied with your job. And so I did a number of tests on the data. So one of the things I do at the end of the year is I throw all my research into a data lake and I look at what is the correlation of data to results. And do people do better if they use consultant A versus consultant B or technology A versus technology B or how they are organized? And the only correlation that I've been able to find is job satisfaction to cost and inventory. Now, you might say, well, what drives job satisfaction? And it's the fact that people feel like what they do matters, that they're recognized, that they are working in an organization that believes in talent, that they have a career path. And one of the things we've got to do, and I wrote a LinkedIn article about this, is to be more sensitive and understanding to the needs of Gen X and millennials. I wrote a LinkedIn article about give Lucy a chance. And it's about my frustration and that I talk to a lot of people, Gen X and millennials when I'm speaking on the road, which I haven't spoken on the road in a while, who want a clear career path. And I have no patience for that discussion. And I had to have a talk with Laura about, I need patience for that discussion because I believe that people will have 12 careers in you know, their lifetime, and that it's very hard to predict what's gonna happen. I mean, when I graduated from college in 72, there wasn't this thing called supply chain. And so it just is so illogical to me that Gen X and millennials want a clear career path. And I had a talk over tea with uh, a wonderful gal who says, Laura, you don't understand. We are pressured now to get great SATs, great ACTs, get our career paths defined early, get those coaches. We've got all this college debt. We want a clear career path. Right. We want to know how we're going to win in the organization. And so I had to talk with Laura and I said, us baby boomers need to be far more sensitive to the needs of younger generation to maybe not define it in terms of black and white, but define it in terms of how do they open up the doors that we don't know exist today, but are coming? Mm. Those are my three takeaways. Do any of those resonate with you guys? Oh yeah. Well, absolutely. I mean, I'm more of marbled rye than stale white bread, um, okay. Latin American, <laughs> Native American and Irish. So, um, but, but I absolutely agree because I'm a Gen Xer myself and I feel like I have been pushing this boulder uphill my entire career. It's, in some places, I feel like I've been successful. The automotive retail industry was far ahead of uh, when I was still in industry. It was far ahead of industries that I served as a service provider. Um, and so I feel like 
since 1992, I've gone backwards some and continue to go backwards as I go up, I call it up the chain back into manufacturing. But I also recognize why that occurs. One, all the margins are in manufacturing so they can afford to be sloppy in their supply chain. Um, but, but I have experienced this. And by the way, being an arguably um, white male does not make a difference when the argument is this is the way we've always done it, right? When a lot of baby boomer processes were there right here, right? They are not documented or not well documented. They're well known and well ingrained in the people who are doing it. But that is a constant battle as well. And I think that's a recognition that I've spent a career forcing, frankly. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and we are starting to see a turn, but I think that, that the entree of the new generations, millennials and iGen, who absolutely demand, frankly, can't even operate without an app-like experience, right? They can't have 37 screens on a green screen system. I think that has been a huge catalyst and it's mm -hmm. frankly helped a lot of us, Laura, probably some of your initiatives get over the line as well, because there is no choice, as you said, right? It doesn't matter what your perspective and frankly it doesn't matter what mine as a gen x is anymore if we want these future generations to be effective we have to acknowledge that that's how they'll be effective i think it's fortunate by the way in the fact that it is what needs to come now and and then to if you talk about people of color and other cultures and geographies and things like that I think that is hugely valuable. I mean, you and I, we've traveled all over the world. We get to see that in person, right? We get to see the value of those differing perspectives, whether that's in Africa, in Europe, in Asia, wherever, South America, you know, um, the value of those differing perspectives is so critically important. What we, what I see and I repeat, and Scott is gonna probably roll his eyes because I say it so often, we need to extract the knowledge of baby boomers because it is so incredibly in depth and so valuable and leaving us at an incredibly rapid rate, especially now with COVID. We have to extract that knowledge and we have to impart that knowledge either in the players in supply chain now or into the technology that will support that. You know, I'm a firm believer that artificial intelligence doesn't matter unless you have actual intelligence to feed it, mm -hmm. right? A lot of people think of artificial t intelligence as this great overlord. I think of it as a child that needs to be taught from the knowledge of the people who have been doing it the right way. But we so have to cease to use one term, and that is, this is the way we've always done it. I mean, that, that's incredibly s simple perspective, but, and that's one perspective on one point. I could go on for hours. All right, so, so uh, this is the way. That reminds me of The Mandalorian is one of my, my kids' favorite shows right now. And this is the way is, is a mantra throughout that series. Right. There's, a, there's a ton of, of commentary from our community, Laura, I want to pose to you uh, really quick. Uh, let's see, Clay says, that final point could, have, could not have resonated stronger with me. Thank you for having that sensitive and empathetic mindset. We can all learn something here from here. Sophia says, I think that a clear career path depends on identifying your passion early on in university. And mm -hmm. that's not easy. Jacob, uh, as a Gen Zer, I would love a clear career path, but I understand that there are constant changes within the world. Uh, God, we, we've got about a thousand comments here. I'm going to try to get through some of them. David says, lack of experience does not mean lack of ability. Take a chance on people that are trying to break into any industry they wouldn't be here if they didn't have an interest in doing it. Um, and uh, Nerfad had a play on your uh, your bread analogy there, Greg. Uh, he'd be an uh, Arabic samoon that expands as it gets hot inside and slowly releases its aromas to pleasure people all over the world. Please don't take it out of context. Um, no shortage of commentary. But Laura, you know, going back to education and going back to uh, you know all the different ways that you, that the talent pipeline is impacted coming into industry, right? As we're vying to mold and develop and coach and mentor and get it into, you know, uh, industries like supply chain, you know, your story that you share with Corinne about your educational experience and, and that one professor that held up the, 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 the subpar grade. And I can't remember exactly what, what you shared that he said, but it was something like, this is why women should not be in engineering. He did not say that. He, he did say that. Absolutely yeah. did say that. Yeah, University of Tennessee, I made a D in 
statics, which is a tough topic for chemical engineers. And yeah. I was one of two women in the class. And I actually had a conversation with the Dean of Engineering at University of Tennessee, which has come a long, long way. I mean, the 1970s, right? right? I, there just weren't women, right? But I, I think that, um, you know, people fail, they learn, you know. But anyway, Scott, I missed. Go ahead. Well, the the what I want to kind of get you to speak to is those um, whether it's education, whether it's how we hire, whether it's how we manage talent, whether it is how much how much real investment we put into making make sure making sure our team members are truly satisfied and engaged and and really enjoy what they do. What what some of the what what else in those things need to change? Do you believe? I think that a couple of things. Uh, one, I think we're not in contact with how much difference we can make in an individual's life. Uh, I would not be doing what I do today without a mentor. His name was Bob Marsden. Man, I hated oh, yeah. this last phase of chemical engineering, right? He was my plant manager for a co-op experience at Procter & Gamble. I was ready to drop out of chemical engineering school because it was so tough. And he said, buck up, Laura you're going to enjoy manufacturing and, you know, and I loved it, right? Procter & Gamble was good to me. I loved the climate, the creative nature, participative team management. And he mentored me and he coached me and he probably has no idea, right? And I had a conversation uh, with another mentor of mine, Joe Krakowska. And Joe said to me, you know, we've really got to manage ourselves as we go from organization to organization. And we can't necessarily hold the same paradigms. And so, and the impact of others on us, mentoring, coaching, managing ourselves, I think are really important concepts. But the other thing is I think we have to constantly learn. And in that process of learning, we've got to unlearn, to relearn, to rethink the possibilities. Uh, you know, I'm, I have to always manage Laura, right? Because, you know, she's a very opinionated woman, right? And I've got to say, okay, now, is that really the truth here, right? Let's listen. Let's not only listen for what's being said, but let's listen for what's not being said. And let's look at the patterns and constantly learn, right? And um, we've got to develop ourselves, right? I, I write about 3,000 words a day, and I really try to be a good writer. And I have a writing coach, and my writing coach says to me, you cannot be a good writer unless you do reading of good work, right? And I think for supply chain, we can't be great supply chain leaders if we are not surrounding ourselves by thought leadership in either the business world or academia and really challenging our paradigms. Mm, well said. Well said. Yeah. <laughs> well, said. well, you know, I, I think part of what you shared there, the thought that came to my mind is even though social media trains us not to do it, is is react less, pause and think and be willing to really challenge that assumption that you that are maybe a long held assumption or or one that you've just recently made. Right. Because the world is is really changing at this this incredibly rapid rate where you know, uh, the, the old schools of thought where certain assumptions, certain best practices were, you know, generational. They may be, they, they may have a shelf life of a week these days, maybe a day. So stop, don't react, think, and really do that personal inventory. It's some of what I heard Seek you said. First to understand, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And as Sophia points out, let's listen for what's not being said with what Laura just said. Uh, William shares, I think that if, we can solve the problems we see in working together in supply chain. We can transfer the solution solving mindset to solving problems in society. Excellent point. Completely agree. Completely agree. Greg, we've talked here numerous times through the challenging year that 2020 is that supply chain is, is going to help us break into not just post pandemic, break through some of these, you know, social injustice, a, a wide variety of challenges that we are also facing and experiencing. Right. Yeah, I agree. And, I, you know, I think as I was thinking about um, the, you know, the other points that you raised in your, in, in, you know, that you think are the key takeaways, I, 
I was thinking back that this generational change is, is a critical component to addressing all of those things. Laura, you're way too young, but my parents are baby boomers. And, and I think that Generation X is a great bridge from baby boomers to the millennial and Gen Z because we're their parents. We are the parents of, of Gen Z and millennials, and um, at least I am. And, um, and we're the children of baby boomers. So we understand in a certain perspective, both of those generations. And we, I think we need to be at this generation needs to be a bridge. We need to be conscious of the value presented. And I try very hard to do that of the value presented by each of these generations and make that connection. The beautiful thing is, right? Kids like, like and listen to their grandparents much more than they do their parents. So you have to kind of take that perspective, right? Um, there is a ton of value and I am not a fan of the dismissive, oh, that's okay, boomer thing. I despise that by the way. And I'm glad that that died out uh, because there is a lot of value. I mean, especially these days, Boomer, my parents were hippies, right? So they were the disruptors that all these, the, the people with a Y in their head that all these kids want to be today. And some of them are, of course, of course, adults now. But um, I, I think there's, there is more in common than there is in difference. And we just need to, we need to break through that perspective. One, that just because baby boomers have always done it that way, that that's the way to do it and start to extract the value from that and translate that value into these new generations. Sorry, that was a bit of a tirade, but well said. Uh, Always, it, but I, I, be, I really believe this generational transition is the key to all of the other things that we want to accomplish, including uh, sustainability and diversity and inclu inclusivity and all of those things. Um, because I really believe that the boomer generation they were the first catalyst for all of this change. They were out there in headbands and having fun maybe smoking a little bit of weed and promoting these things. <laughs> well, so uh, to our audience, the, we called it the uh, origin story that Laura uh, shared with Corinne Bursa, kind of her journey through all, you, you'd be surprised perhaps if you're new to Laura Cesaria, all the different things that she experienced and did throughout her career. So check that out. Amanda Clay, if we could drop that episode link in the comments, that'd be great. And as we wrap here today, Laura, I hate to bring it to a close because I feel like I know I can speak for Greg here. There's so much else. It'll be so fascinating to talk with you about. We'll have to have you back, but let's make sure folks know how to connect with you and, and your blog. And of course, uh, get all the other, uh, the, those 3000 words a day that you're writing, where can folks find all that? So I write three places. Uh, I write for Forbes. So I write case studies of supply chain leaders in Forbes. And I write about kind of what I see as happenings. And I'm taking the case studies to basically build and write my next hard copy book. Uh, I also write eBooks every year from all of the blog posts that I do. I write on the Supply Chain Shaman, which is my personal blog, which in the Shaman, I write about what's happening in technology. How do we rethink technology? On LinkedIn, I'm a LinkedIn influencer. I write about careers and lessons learned. And on Forbes, I write more of a business. And then I do a monthly newsletter and I do an annual event. And my goal is to help people to learn from the past, to unlearn, to rethink supply chain. And I just want to leave with, you know, Bob Marsden had no idea the impact on me. And I answer every LinkedIn in mail that I get. And I think Together, we need to really work on helping supply chain to drive improvement in the world. I believe it builds economies. I think it, you know, is at the root issue of really big, hairy problems like sustainability and uh, effectiveness. And I think that what we have done is we've lost course with you know, financial reengineering that has caused a lot of waste. We've pushed cost and pay waste back in the supply chain. We've really not built value networks. I think we've got to change that. And that's what I'm all about. Love it. Well, love what you do. Love having you here. Um, we need to have a fuller episode. 25 minutes does not do Greg, Laura, Cesare. Actually, 25 minutes doesn't do Greg White. 25 and hours, Justice. 25 days. None of it does. So, Thanks, guys. Always well, a pleasure. I just have to say this before you go, Laura, I really appreciate the perspective that you have, the challenging of the status quo, the, the, just the challenging, not even 
the challenging of the established status quo, but challenging people to be better. You did it to me once. It changed the, it tra changed the direction of my company. And I want you to know that you had that impact, uh, an impact I know you don't recall, but um, I really appreciate it. I've admired what you've done from afar for a long time. And I'm glad that, that more and more people, although it feels like everybody on the planet is already connected to you, more and more people are getting to see that. And more and more people should, because there's no BS when you're talking to Laura Cesari or hearing <laughs> from Laura Cesari. It's just the truth. Well yeah, I'm said. known as a direct shooter. So thanks, guys. Hey, thanks so much, Laura Cesari. Founder Thanks. Supply Chain Insights. Have a great day. Yep. Okay. Take care, Laura. Wow, man. There's That's so all I got to say. Is <laughs> <laughs> well, really, I, um, I can't. I can't talk enough about just the open approach. You know, there's so many folks that yeah, look at our media. Just, just your everyday newspaper these days is behind a subscription. Just the news of the day. So to, so to put That's why I don't, Yeah, Wall Street Journal. Right. I've had a constant argument with the Wall Street Journal. They sell ads and yet they want to sell subscriptions. And I just think, <laughs> well, just so, don't mess with my weekly, my Saturday edition of the Wall Street Journal. Big fan of that. But the, the point being all the, you know, all the work that it takes to produce, you know, professional research and, and, and data and, and actionable insights and to make that, you know, put that out there for the, for the global industry. I mean, I, I really admire that approach and, Really have uh, love having Laura here to, to kind of expound on some of that. So y'all check out to the community. Check out. I think we put the episode link. We put the research link out there. Uh, certainly encourage you to uh, connect and follow up with Laura and, and enjoy her content and thought leadership as much as Greg and I have. All right. So, Greg, ton of comments. I couldn't get the I, I tried to share some of those as we were we we're all kind of wading through that conversation. But clearly, uh, the conversation has resonated with our community. Yeah, and let's just acknowledge that we really appreciate your comments and and would love to get back to them. But no one's comments on this show, including mine or Scott's, are they pale in comparison to anything that we can learn from Laura. I mean, you know, we talk to a lot of people who are or uh, hope to be influencers, whatever that means. Laura has been in influencing the supply chain for decades and in the right direction. I can't stress that enough just enough questioning, just enough um, straightforwardness, directness, as she says, right? Um, never irrationally so, even when she's handing you your ass in a comment, in a, con in a discussion, it's, it's always spot on. It's always something you know, you, you take it away like you would talking to your parents, knowing you're angry about it, but she's right. <laughs> well, I tell you, um, all this comes from a genuine spot. So, you know, uh, I really enjoy this. Is the second time I've, I've had a chance to kind of directly have a conversation with Laura after, you know, being a big fan of reading her, her content for a long time. So really yeah. rewarding, uh, to be here. All right. So let's switch gears as we start to wind down today's episode, Greg, we were talking about returns early on. That's going to be the, mm -hmm. the topic on many supply chain leaders' minds. Well, the, one of the greatest enablers in e-commerce and returns is, of course, Jeff Bezos. And, and also waste. <laughs> right. Hey, I was going to I, I was gonna uh, be easy there, but, but you're right. You're absolutely right. They've got some big challenges at Amazon uh, to tackle plastic and uh, a variety of waste. But really cool. I, I, we released today on This Week in Business History, uh, 10 things that I bet you didn't know about Jeff Bezos. And we tried to handpick these. There's a couple probably that some folks that may know the story or read certain books may know, but I learned a ton over the weekend as we prepared for this. And big thanks to Deb Cooey, who also conducted the research. But y'all check this out. And one instance, one of my favorites, Greg, really quick. I'm not sure if this is number eight or number nine, but uh, in 1997, Jeff Bezos was invited to Harvard to speak to a, a graduate business class. And, and, and at the time, you know, early stage, pre-public. Uh, and as the story goes, uh, the students weren't really, you know, enthralled with his presentation, right? They weren't sitting there like this. They were mm -hmm. having conversations and, and just, you know, perhaps being a little disrespectful. In fact, it got to a point at one point during the presentation where one of the grad students was quoted as saying this, 
quote, you seem like a really nice guy, so don't take this the wrong way, but you need to sell to Barnes and Noble and get out now, end quote. So interestingly enough and fittingly, we'll, we'll call it, Jeff Bezo Bezos later that same year would take Amazon public and would raise about $54 million before continuing to build out, you know, perhaps one of the biggest iconic companies of our, of our generation. Um, so you, you never know that, that stood out. There was a time when he made his grandmother cry when he was 10 years old. That really was a huge lesson learned and you'll have to tune into the episode to learn more, but, uh, really enjoyed. I, I love lists. I think I get that from my wife, Amanda, and it was really neat to, to build that list with, with, you know, one of the leading figures, uh, here that we hear about and read about just about every day. Wouldn't you love to know where that student is today? Yes. <laughs> Man, it's like you're probably working for Barnes and Noble <laughs> in their one of their handful of remaining stores. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, well, yeah, that, that's that's interesting. Um, by the way, I got to tell you, my um, my wife ha occasionally has um, trouble sleeping in the middle of the night. She likes to get up and vacuum or whatever it, it is that she does because I'm a very heavy sleeper. And she tried to listen to the sleep channel and, and it is stories like you do on business history. So I'm going to warn people, if you think you're going to listen to these, this week in business history shows and get to sleep, the stories are way too interesting. And that is the problem that my wife has is she can't get to sleep because she has to hear the end of the story and then <laughs> regale me with the story the next, next day. So oh, these are, a they are a really interesting take on some things you don't know about people that you do know. Well, I appreciate that. And that's too kind. I've never really thought about that. I, I have to have something playing when I'm sleeping at night and really, I'm big, yeah, I'm a big art bell fan. So I'm not sure if anyone's heard of art bell coast to coast AM, uh, midnight, midnight in the desert. I can't remember the name of the second series anyway, but to your point, Greg, exactly. I use it to help me sleep. Plus I, I love some of the intriguing topics. But sometimes at two o'clock, it can keep you up <laughs> to, to yeah. you too much. So, um, but I appreciate your comments. I uh, really have enjoyed this week in business history and uh, looking forward to what's what's to come. We're gonna, we've got some interesting programming where we're going to bring uh, students of business on, uh, you know, kind of um, you know, folks that really take keen interest in business history and, and give us their, you know, two or three key historical, you know, things we're going to be talking about from a business standpoint, a hundred years from now, from 2020. So stay tuned for that. Um, and of course, to our community, you can check, you know, find the information on all of our series at supplychainnow.com, including Tequila Sunrise, had a really cool episode last week, uh, Digital Transformers, Supply Chain is Boring, which has gotten a lot of play here lately, but check that out, where we aim to serve as the voice of supply chain, making sure that this global industry is seen and heard. So Greg, yeah, hey, before, yep, sorry, go ahead. You, you're reading my mind. <laughs> hey folks, always. if you if you ever wondered if this is rehearsed, now you know. <laughs> go, go ahead, Scott. Well, before we sign off for the day, we're going to be a few minutes over. But before we sign off, any any final thoughts on your end? Let me just give one quick pitch, and then yes, absolutely, final thoughts. Uh, and that is that this week we're doing a live stream on Tequila Sunrise, and it is. Uh, again, with the great Corinne Bursa. And Scott, are you going to join us? Would you care to join us? So, I'm not I trying was, to put you on the spot. Just trying to put you on the spot. NRF kicks off this week. And oh, got it. Okay. One of, the things, one of our obligations happens to be during that live stream. But, right. That's okay. You and Corinne, the, the power duo, I think will be in good hands. So, it is Ask Us Anything. It is an Ask Us Anything episode. I know some of you have been listening to to Tequila Sunrise for months now. We started back in August, late July, August. Um, and we've got a ton of episodes in the can. And some of you have said, I have so many questions, so we are, so you better bring them. Uh, so ask us anything. And that includes Corinne, who recall is a longtime technology marketing guru. So if you have a tech company out there, feel free to ask. Can't guarantee that she'll answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you'll, you'll at least get a, get a, uh, some good, good feedback. 12 noon Thursday. It's going to be our Thursday live stream. It's going to be that uh, tequila sunrise branded live stream. Love that. I love the last one about giving w was really well received. Got a lot of feedback around that one that you and Corinne 
led with a variety of uh, other folks. Um, all right. So we're going to wrap on just one thing, Greg, just one thing. If there's one thing Laura shared here today uh, that the research points to or something you heard today, what's that one thing that folks need to know? The, it, it, what they need to know is that the change that is required in supply chain, as she said, is not necessarily in the operations. It's in what people understand about the industry, how they bring people of all types and skills into the industry, and 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 how they utilize the knowledge that they they have gained either through academia or in practice and how they use that to make this a better place. Scott, as you said, you can change the world through supply chain. So that's what you need to take away from this. Love that. And of course, uh, big thanks to Amanda and Clay behind the scenes and, and Natalie, apologies, Natalie and Clay and Amanda all helped with the production today. Uh, big thanks, of course, to Laura Ciceri. Uh, make sure you check her out. Uh, supply chain insights and supply chain shaman. Uh, there's a reason why she's got a great following and, and y'all tasted some of that here today. Uh, she, she tells it like it is and much like Greg, Greg, that's one thing I appreciate about you. Regardless what it is, that's what you say and uh, makes for great genuine conversations. Um, all right. So everybody, again, uh, check us out. If you enjoyed today's episode, find us wherever you get your podcast from. Be sure to check out Tequila Sunrise and Supply Chain is Boring and This Week in Business History and Veteran Voices. Really excited about where that series is going as well. Of course, you can find information on all of that at supplychainnow.com. Perhaps equally as important of anything you heard here today, it's about the action you take. It's not about lip service leadership. It's about action. So Amen. do good. Give forward. Be the change that's needed. Be like Lars Cesare. And on that note, we'll see you next time here on Supply Chain Now. Thanks, everybody.